Transforming grace. Hundreds of you in this room have experienced it. Some of you will experience it today. That's the name of the series that I, we gave to the series we're doing on the book of 1 Peter. Two weeks ago, we looked at how God transformed this man, Peter. Last week, we looked at Peter's description of believers, elect exiles of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and sanctification in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to the truth. This morning, I would like you to read with me. I'd like you to stand. We're going to read two verses, verses 3 and 4 of 1 Peter 1. Stand with me as we read God's Word this morning. It will also be on our screens if you don't have your Bible with you. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, this morning, we are in awe, Father, of the work You did in Your Son, the Lord Jesus, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, buried And you raised him from the dead on the third day. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And this morning, Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit to testify to the truth that he is alive. By changing lives through the power of the gospel. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Dr. Jerome Groupman is a doctor at the Harvard Medical School. He's also a medical school professor. He has diagnosed thousands of people with serious diseases. And he says in a book that he wrote that he discovered that the one thing all these people with diseases share in common is, quote, they are all looking for a sense of genuine hope. In fact, he says that that hope was as important to them as anything he might prescribe to them as a physician. In his book, The Anatomy of Hope, when asked for his definition of hope, Groupman said hope was basically the ability to see a path to the future. You are facing dire circumstances and you need to know everything that's blocking, blocking or threatening you. And then you see a path, a potential path to get to where you want to be. Once you see that, there's a tremendous emotional uplift that occurs. And then he closes with this quote, quote, I think hope is, has been, is, and will be the heart of medicine and healing. We could not live without hope. Even with all the medical technology available, we still come back to the profound human need to believe that there is a possibility to reach a future that is better than the one in the present. It has been said that human beings are able to endure just about anything but hopelessness. Is that working? Okay i got to go back to my earpiece. Hold that thought. I will be right with you.
There we go. In his play, the atheist Jean-Paul Sartre, a play called No Exit, said, quote, hell begins where hope ends. One prominent psychologist, psychologist likens hope to oxygen. He says, we can't live without it. Martin Luther once said, quote, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. And I think you'll agree with me that the author of this letter, Peter, himself knew something about hope. I think it's safe to say that no apostle among the apostles felt the death of Jesus more agonizingly than did Simon Peter. Partly because Simon had boasted that no, he would never leave or forsake the Lord. He bragged that he would remain true to Jesus to the end. Peter meant well, but he failed so miserably. And when it really mattered, a little girl asked him a question, and he utterly denied knowing Jesus three times before this little girl and others. All the apostles experienced loss of hope when Jesus died, but Peter had the additional shame of having denied that he even knew the Lord three times. And I believe there are men and women in this room this morning. You're like Peter in some ways. All of your dreams have perhaps been shattered. Maybe you had a dream that God was going to use you in a significant way, and it hasn't panned out. Maybe you had a business idea and great plans for a great business that came crashing down around you. Maybe your marriage presently is wrecked and it started off wonderfully and as the years have gone by, your dream of a happy home has come crashing down upon you. Maybe you had plans of retiring only to find out at the end of your working years that there's not enough money to do so. You feel like your world has caved in on you. Well, that's how Peter felt after Jesus was arrested and crucified. It wasn't supposed to end this way. And those days that followed the crucifixion, those three dark dismal days, days without hope, days of darkness and gloom and despair that is palpable. All of that darkness, gloom, misery, despair, and hopelessness all was drowned in a moment when Peter and John raced to the tomb and there, after being told by women who went to the tomb early that he was not there, Peter runs into the tomb and enters in and then realizes in a moment life would never be the same. Later he would hear these words, He is not here. He is risen. That reality that Jesus of Nazareth was not dead but alive, that reality became the central pivot point around which Peter and the other apostles would live their lives. And years later, when writing this letter to believers in Turkey, in modern Turkey, he speaks that because of what God did in the work of His Son by raising Him from the dead, believers now share in what Peter calls wonderfully a living hope. And for Peter, this living hope is not hope like we often, what we often call hope. Like, you know, you buy a lottery ticket. I won't ask a show of hands. I wonder how many bought the ticket last week or up to last week and you were hoping against hope that your ticket had the winning ticket because you wanted to tithe to the church. Or you hope 
that your boss gives you a promotion, or you hope that your surgery is successful. In these kinds of situations, they speak of hope, but they are an earthly hope. They are rooted in something immediate which often doesn't turn out. But that is not what Peter means when he says, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Peter is writing of a sure hope. A hope that author Edmund Clowney calls, quote, a hope that holds the future in the present because it is anchored in the past. Look how Peter starts this section. What he's about to tell these believers is so wonderful, so grand, so glorious that he does it in praise and exaltation to God. And this is found all over the New Testament. You know the loftiest theology in the New Testament is given in the presence or in the atmosphere of worship? It's uh, uh, eulogizing God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we saw last week, the entire Godhead is involved in our salvation. But it all originates, Peter says, in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just like the opening of the book of Ephesians, here 1 Peter opens by eulogizing God. This is worship, listen, informed by theology. Worship should be informed by theology. How many know the songs our band picked this morning, pre they preach the gospel to us? You didn't have to wait till I get up, or you didn't have to wait for Paul's corny jokes. <laughs> but the gospel was preached. Theology drives worship. Remember how Paul does this at the end of the doctrinal section in Romans? When he goes through Romans 1 through 11, and he's so moved by the thoughts that he has been saying and thinking about by the grandeur and the greatness of God's plan that he bursts out at the end of Romans 11. Oh, I love that O. Oh. It's not like, oh. That's the wrong O. Oh. It's, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable scrutable are His ways. Right at the beginning of the letter, He lets out this burst of worship. Some say worship is primarily emotional. I will agree that worship is emotional. I don't know about you this morning, but I got real emotional when I was singing some of these songs. Some of you maybe come from a background where emotions are parked at the door at church. You can scream your head off at a UT football game, but God wants you to be reserved. But listen to me, God created emotions to be experienced, and in worship, uh, emotions are not to be parked at the door. They should be informed by our minds, and our minds should be informed by Holy Scripture. It's not just emotion. It's emotion which is spurred by the theology that we are talking about. I cannot study the Bible and sit on my chair. Sometimes I have to put it down and get lost in God in worship because He is amazing. And the reason Peter is so excited is because he is blessing God for the greatness of this salvation. He has reason to be excited. The Father has not just made salvation possible, the Father has actually given birth to a people. In the words of Peter, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Listen to those words. According to His great mercy. Great mercy. Peter might have been thinking of the mercy that Jesus had on him a miserable failure after the resurrection. Maybe he was thinking great mercy of the way that Jesus appeared to Peter and the others the third time in John's Gospel. When Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Peter affirmed his love for the Lord. And three times Jesus reaffirmed that Peter was to pastor his flock, which he will tell us he does as a fellow elder in 1 Peter 5. Peter received after his denial, not just mercy, but great mercy. It's the same thing Paul will describe in Ephesians chapter 2 after describing the pitiful condition that sinners are in and they are children of God, children of wrath as the rest. Then he says those matchless words, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Sometimes we get mercy and grace confused. They are similar, but they are not the same. Mercy is God not punishing you and I for, uh, as our sins deserve, while grace is God's blessing us with what we don't deserve. Think about this morning what you and I deserve. One of the elders this morning, I think it was Tyler, said we watched the Passion of the Christ as a family. And as he was going through all that agony and suffering, Tyler mentioned to his family, that was what we deserve. But if you're in Christ this morning, you're the recipient of great mercy. Mercy would be enough, but it's great mercy. He's rich in mercy. You know what Paul calls believers in Romans chapter 11? He calls them vessels of mercy. He says others are vessels of wrath, but we are vessels of mercy. Now what did His mercy do for us because of the resurrection? I love this phrase. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. This is the glorious truth of regeneration, the doctrine of regeneration, the truth that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God raised us up by giving us new life. And this doctrine is meaningless unless you understand the problem. In fact, it was to a religious man who was impeccably righteous That Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That was the message of the great English evangelist George Whitfield during the first great awakening. And all he preached is you must be born again. And somebody finally said, George, why do you only preach you must be born again? And Whitfield said, because you must be born again. This is not a call to reform yourself to try to change yourself, but first a realization that you and I as sinners, that our only hope is God gives us new life. You see, you and I are members of a race that is in rebellion to our Creator. And as a result of that rebellion, I know you look nice on the outside. Don't I look nice? in my only Easter jacket. But you and I have a nature, apart from Christ, we have a nature of rebellion that alienates us from God. And the only hope is not to turn over a new leaf 
or try to reform yourself. The only hope is that God changes you and I on the inside by a work of the Spirit. It is called being born again. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. And we don't think we need this until God opens our eyes. You know, one person once wisely said, the great need in evangelism is not to get people saved, but to get people lost. Because when people say, i got to get back in church, I took up cigarette smoking or drinking, they're bad habits, but that's not why you need to be saved. It's far worse. I wish the only thing wrong with you is cigarette smoke. But the Bible says you must be born again because lost men and women are alienated from a holy God. And once our eyes are open to see our lostness, once we really see our lostness, folks, we will be persuaded that our only hope is for God to raise us from the dead. And you, Ephesians 2.1, has He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. That's the verdict, folks. You can argue with Scripture. You're not just asleep or not need a little awakening. You're not just sick and you need a little medicine. You are dead outside of Christ. That doesn't mean you're not alive physically and soulishly. You are. But it means apart from God raising you from the dead, you're dead in relation to God. But God raises the dead. It's called the new birth. November 9th, 1971. And it's not necessary to know the exact moment when it occurs, but I do because it was a profound disruption and change. I was sitting in a room and I heard the Gospel. And I had heard it before from my brother's lips. But that night, God opened my heart to believe the Gospel. And new life came into me. And I left that building, November 9th, 1971, my first words out of my mouth, never, never having read the New Testament, was I said, everything looks new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Look at the result of God causing us to be born again. We're not going to get to the inheritance in this message. That's for next week. But he says, as a result of causing us to be born again, we have been born again, listen, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is again, this living hope. More than a hope that things will get better in my life. In fact, can I be honest with you? I shouldn't do this on Easter Sunday, but I, I must. When I read the rest of this letter, things don't get better for these Christians, they get worse. In chapter 1, verse 6, we will see that they can expect manifold or various trials. In chapter 2, they can expect rough treatment at the hands of masters if they're slaves. In chapter 3, women can expect difficulty dealing with unsaved husbands that they're married to. Over and over again, Peter will say in the chapter 3 at the end, if you open your mouth and defend the Gospel, you will suffer. The living hope is not the promise that you won't go through difficulty and suffering. That is not the Gospel. And those who are promising that, anathema. It's not true. The living hope is a hope which reaches beyond this world, but affects this world. It's the blessed hope that what happened to Jesus on Easter Sunday awaits all those who trust in Him. This living hope is a past, a present, and a future reality because of the resurrection. The past. It is a fact that this morning we celebrate that the blessed second person of the Trinity came out of the Godhead and lived among us a perfect life without sin inwardly 
or externally. Think about that. He went through 33 years of life on this planet and never in thought, word, and deed did he sin. He was without blemish. And it is a fact which my Jewish people have tried to refute for centuries. But it is a fact that he died. One of the ways we know that he died, contrary to popular Jewish opinions that he didn't die, he simply fainted and his disciples took him down before the, and convinced the world that he had died. The Romans, my friends, were experts at ascertaining if a man was dead when crucified. They had it down to a science. They invented it. And even though some say he only appeared to be dead, all of the Gospels testify that Jesus of Nazareth died and was placed in a tomb. Those same Gospels, though, testified that God's power reached down on Easter Sunday. And by the way, because I just finished my third Seder this week. Hallelujah, it's over. I love it, but... Oh. And this is a Jewish holiday today. It's called the Sheaf of the Feast of the First Fruits. Early in the morning, on the Sunday of Passover week, they would bring a sheaf from the standing harvest, and the priests would wave it early Sunday morning. And isn't it interesting? It's called the Sheaf of the First Fruits. And Jesus is called by Paul the first fruits of those who sleep. I can't prove it, but I have a suspicion that as the priest was waving that sheaf 2,000 years ago, right at that moment, the Son of God came out of the tomb. I wouldn't be surprised. And Peter says, our living hope is based and anchored, as Clowney says, it's anchored in the past. We know, we know the heart of Christianity is the belief Christianity is not a belief in an ethical system. It is not a moral system, though it produces morality. Christianity rises and falls on one truth that cannot be altered or messed with. Jesus Christ bodily came out of the grave 2,000 years ago, and He's been alive forevermore. And unlike others who were raised like Lazarus, you know, I was thinking of that my mind works this way. I was thinking about the guy who did Lazarus' second funeral. I think he went like this. Dearly beloved, kept looking, is he really here? I want to meet that guy in heaven. I'm the guy that did the second funeral. <laughs> Do you get this morning that this separates Christianity from every religion? It really does. Buddha is dead. Moses is dead. Muhammad is dead. Nobody argues that. But if you take away the resurrection of the Son of God, you have no Christianity. In fact, Paul says, you, the, your faith is in vain and you're still in your sins if Jesus is not raised from the dead. He says, it's pointless. It doesn't matter. Christianity is a much ado about nothing if Jesus of Nazareth is dead. But I love in the end of the book of Acts when Paul is defending the gospel. Festus is telling Agrippa, I've got this Jew. He believes this carpenter from Galilee. He keeps saying he, he died, but he keeps saying he's alive. By the way, that was the message of the early church. It wasn't Jesus loves you and died for your sins. The message that confronted the early world and it needs to be restored if we're going to confront our world is Jesus is alive. He's Lord. God made Him Lord. But what does this mean for the present? For the past, it means we look back and we know. Nobody in this room has seen Jesus. Unless you had a vision, which sometimes God gives people, but nobody's actually seen the physical Lord. But in the present, what does this resurrection mean? Here's what it means. Remember Jesus' words? I love this. Because I live, you shall live also. The fact that he's alive 
is not meant to be a fact that we merely look back on anchored in the past. We're anchored in the past so that the living Christ might be a present reality. I want everybody hearing my voice to understand that Christianity is a living thing. It's not following rituals and sacraments and traditions. It's walking with the living one who has overcome. And he guarantees that we shall overcome as well. Think about it as proof that the resurrection has power in the present. Think about it. We need not look any further than looking at the 12 apostles to know how the risen Lord makes a difference in the present. Look at the 12 before the resurrection. They were scared, spineless men who ran away when it counted most to save their own hides. How do we wrap our arms, if there's no resurrection, how do we wrap our arms around the fact that these scared, spineless men who ran away to save their own skins now became the very men who confronted their enemies with the gospel and gave up their lives all but one? How do we account for that? And how do we account for it in the light of this hoax that supposedly his body was stolen? In the book, The Empty Tomb, the author says, in commenting on the so-called hoax that his disciples stole his body and faked the resurrection, the author says, quote, how they could one day plan and carry through a gigantic hoax and the next day be themselves taken in by it is another thing that utterly defeats my understanding. But that is what happened. And it changed them almost out of recognition. You could practically see them becoming new men before your eyes. Instead of the frightened, dispirited, weak creatures they were on the day of their leader's crucifixion, they were all at once transformed men of boldness, confidence, and strength. Instead of being in terror as they had been, they did not seem to care a rap for any threat we made or even for any action we took. They openly paraded their false doctrine in the streets of the city and deliberately flouted every effort to silence them and still the perplexities continue to pile up. But we can understand the resurrection has power in the present by the testimonies of millions of men and women, hundreds of which are in this room this morning. A man testified, quote, my marriage was about over. My wife and I were on the verge of divorce. I had given up all hope and didn't want to live anymore. Then I came to Christ. I met Jesus and He has given me a new reason to live. Or listen to the testimony of a woman. There may be men and women like this this morning. For years, I was on a guilt trip in my life. There was never a moment that I had any peace. Never a moment I was free from the condemnation of a guilty conscience. Then I began to understand how Jesus loved me and that He's with me and that He's made ample provision for every failure of mine. All I need to do is to acknowledge that failure and I experience afresh the restoration of His forgiveness. What a peace this has brought into my heart and life. How many know when Christ, the risen Lord, is dwelling in your heart, He gives you power to do things you don't think you could ever do? He's alive. It's not only an anchored truth of the past, in the present, He's alive. And then we end with the future. It doesn't stop in the present. We have a future. And we will see next week that Peter's words are really referring to an inheritance, an incredible inheritance that makes Christians rich beyond words. It's the future based on the fact 
that what happened to the body of Jesus will happen to your body. It doesn't matter if you fall asleep in death or if you happen to be alive at the coming of the Lord and His resurrection, which First Thessalonians 4 speaks of, the resurrection. It doesn't matter. You have a glorious future. Jesus was raised bodily, and so shall we be. The older I get, the more delicious this doctrine is. When I got my 60-year-old body out of bed this morning, and all my aches and pains from Fit Club, Paul tells us in Romans 8 that our full adoption as sons will not occur until the redemption of our body. We're adopted children of God now. Now we are children of God, John told us in his letter. But the full manifestation of the sons of God awaits the future. Your body will be changed. And listen, when Jesus was raised, folks, He wasn't a phantom. He was a real man with a real body. Now why do we need new bodies? Because heaven is not Listen, heaven is not our final destination, but a renewed heaven and earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Don't give up on earth yet. Somehow we replace biblical eschatology with middle age myths based on hymns. That the goal is to shuck this body and be a disembodied spirit strumming harps hanging in the stratosphere. Now don't get me wrong. If you die tonight in Christ, you will be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But the goal is not to be absent from your body forever. It is to be raised from the dead. And it is to have a glorious body that reflects the full and final redemptive work of Jesus Christ for His people. We will see next week that heaven is not our ultimate destination. It's the safety deposit box where our inheritance is kept. You and I, our salvation is not complete till we are glorified. For those whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. You know what's amazing about that statement? Glorified is past tense with the rest of it. You might say, well, I know I was foreknown. We talked about that last week. Well, I know I was uh, predestined. I know He called me. I know He justified me, but glorification hasn't happened yet. You're right, it hasn't. But it's so sure in the mind of the apostle, he treats it in the past tense. It will happen to the Lord's people. Now, how do I respond to this? Let me ask you this morning. Do you have this living hope? Is this that I preach this morning what you're basing your life upon? Or are you living with the false hope that things will get better on earth? They might. They might not. No promise. But there is a living hope that isn't predicated by economies, physical conditions, weather, political pawning, it doesn't matter. The living hope invades the present, brings the future into the present because it's anchored in the past. And now here's what God says as the entrance to this living hope. Repent and believe the good news. And respond to the good news by being water baptized and receiving the Spirit. This is not good advice. This is good news. Jesus is alive. Repent. Change your mind. Here's 
a declaration of the gospel. It is based on solid fact. The question this morning, do you really believe it? Oh yeah, I believe it. I've been in church all my life. That doesn't mean you believe it because you've been in church. It doesn't mean you're a Christian any more than I go to a deli every week. That doesn't make me a bagel. And when I ask the question, do you believe it? I don't just mean mentally assent because you grew up believing it, because your parents and your grandparents preached it, and your grandfather was a preacher or whatever. Will you base your entire life on it so that you become transformed? Believing the gospel does require intellectual conviction, but it changes every area of your life because it base, your life is based on these facts, and it is the reality of the resurrection that changes you. Stand with me. I'm going to pray this morning. I'm going to invite you this morning. There'll be people at the front in a moment. If you need prayer, I am inviting you this morning. I believe there are men and women this morning who are being drawn by the gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't understand what repentance and faith is. I'd like our team to come forward. I'd like some of our house church leaders to come forward today, please, as well, since there's more people here. If you feel that the Lord is calling you, your heart is drawn to Jesus. I know what that's like. I was in a service 41 years ago where it was happening to me. As many as received Him, to, to them, He became, they became the children of God who were born not of the will of man nor of the will of flesh, but of God. Need other house church leaders? Come on forward. This morning, I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to release you. I know you have plans for Easter, but the Lord is working in your heart and we I totally zoned out and forgot that there's something called communion so remain standing for a minute we're going to leave with communion it's the last Sunday of the month I was so excited about the gospel I zoned but these people will be here after the communion this morning uh, Tyler come on up and also Paul and they're going to lead us in communion we do this once a month here at Trinity or once on the fifth Sunday of every month uh, and they'll lead us in it.